Welcome back to our channel, where we explore fascinating topics in psychology. In today's video, we'll be diving into an important and often uncomfortable subject, types of group offending. Specifically, we'll be focusing on multiple perpetrator sexual offending. It's crucial to shed light on this issue to understand its complexities and work toward preventing such acts from occurring in the future. Before we delve deeper, let's take a moment to grasp the magnitude of the problem. Shockingly, over 300,000 women in the UK have experienced multiple perpetrator rape in their lifetime. These incidents can occur in various contexts, each with its own unique dynamics. For the rape of peers or adults, we often see this in scenarios involving street gangs, fraternities or even during times of war. The power dynamics and group mentality in these situations can exacerbate the risk of multiple perpetrator sexual offending. For age-related sexual offences against children, this includes disturbing instances involving pedophile organisations, child sex rings and even within residential care settings. These environments create opportunities for heinous crimes to be committed against vulnerable individuals. To gain a better understanding of the factors that can promote multiple perpetrator sexual offending, researchers Harkins and Dixon developed the multifactorial theory of multiple person sexual offending or MPSO. Let's explore some key factors identified in this theory. So as you can see in the visual, there are three areas, individual, situational and social cultural that make up the multiple person sexual offending theory. There is an overlap between each of these three areas. If we look specifically at the overlap that occurs between an individual and also them interacting with their situation, for example, this could be them being part of a gang, we can see that there are group processes which would lead to multiple person sexual offending. These include social comparison, social domination, conformity and obedience to authority. So let's look at these in greater detail now. For social comparison, humans have a natural tendency to compare themselves to others and seek support for their beliefs. For instance, an individual may engage in multiple perpetrator sexual offending within a street gang to gain acceptance from the group. This desire for belonging and acceptance can lead individuals to engage in behaviours they might otherwise not exhibit. Once removed from the group, their confidence returns to normal and they realise the abnormality of their actions. For social dominance, factors like age, gender and arbitrary sets can contribute to multiple perpetrator sexual offending. In pedophile rings, the dominance and manipulation of older individuals over vulnerable children create the horrifying power dynamic. Similarly, in certain gangs or fraternities, gender dynamics and notions of honour may drive individuals to engage in group offending. In terms of conformity, the power of group norms and the influence they have on individuals' attitudes and behaviour cannot be underestimated. Conformity occurs when individuals change their attitude, statements or behaviour to align with a group norm. Normative social influence plays a role as individuals seek acceptance and fear rejection from their group. Pluralistic ignorance can also be at play, where individuals privately reject certain behaviours but publicly display them due to the perceived group consensus. In terms of obedience to authority, the infamous Milgram experiments shed light on the disturbing phenomenon of obedience to authority. As Milgram stated, behaviour that is unthinkable in an individual who is acting in his own way may be executed without hesitation when carried out under orders. Individuals may feel compelled to obey authority figures, believing there will be severe consequences for disobedience and thus justifying their actions. In terms of social corroboration, seeking social corroboration occurs when individuals surround themselves with others who support their shared attitudes or choices. This behaviour can be observed in group offending as individuals look for like-minded individuals who reinforce and validate their distorted beliefs. Understanding the types of group offending, particularly multiple perpetrator sexual offending, requires us to explore these complex factors. By shedding light on these issues, we can work towards prevention, intervention and creating a safer society for all. Let's move on to group dynamics and their influence on offender behaviour. Specifically, we'll be looking at sexual offenders and juvenile offenders, examining the social influence of groups on individuals and discussing various theories related to group behaviour and deviance. Much of what we've discussed in previous videos about effective correctional treatment applies to sexual offenders as well. Studies such as the one conducted by Hans and Etel in 2009 have shown that the principles of effective correctional treatment can be equally applicable to sexual offender programs. 
When it comes to reducing the recidivism rate in sexual offenders, the risk principle doesn't carry the same importance as it does for non-sexual offenders. Instead, the need and responsivity principles play a more significant role. Therapists need to adopt qualities such as encouragement, guidance and a non-confrontational approach to ensure effective delivery of treatment. Key phases in treating sexual offenders involve winning their trust, motivating them to participate and engaging them in the treatment process. It's crucial for therapists to strike the right balance between their personality and the treatment delivery. However, the effectiveness of treatment also relies heavily on the correct procedures being followed. In a group setting, factors like group cohesiveness and expressiveness are important. Group cohesiveness refers to the degree of support and respect among group members, while expressiveness indicates how comfortable participants feel expressing their opinions and emotions. Juvenile offenders often come to therapy not voluntarily, but through referrals. Hence, the therapist's approach becomes even more critical. It's essential to recognise that many youngsters who sexually offend might have experienced sexual abuse themselves, so addressing their traumas can be beneficial. Traumatic symptoms can hinder the responsiveness of young individuals to treatment, since young sexual offenders might be reluctant to engage fully in treatment. Forming a strong therapeutic alliance and employing the right approach becomes even more crucial than with adult offenders. Let's shift our focus to the broader concept of how groups influence individual behaviour. William James proposed that the self can be changed depending on the social environment it is in, and group membership can play a significant role in shaping our attitudes and behaviours. Social identity approach suggests that individuals derive part of their self-concept from the groups they belong to. Social categorization helps individuals make sense of a chaotic world and influences their attitudes and behaviours. This can lead to the outgroup homogeneity effect, where individuals perceive the outgroup as more homogenous than it actually is. Social identification, which involves knowledge and emotional connection with groups, plays a vital role in how individuals behave. Taj Fell's minimal group experiments demonstrate how even minimal group memberships can create in-group bias and affect individuals' attitudes and behaviours. Tarchfeld's minimal group experiments were a series of pioneering studies conducted by the social psychologist Henry Tarfell and his colleagues in the 1970s. These experiments aim to investigate the psychological mechanisms underlying group behaviour and intergroup discrimination. The studies focused on how people form attitudes and behaviours based on group memberships, even when those group memberships are entirely arbitrary and have no real significance. The experiments were conducted in the context of social identity theory, which posits that an individual's self-concept is influenced by the social groups they belong to. According to this theory, people strive to maintain a positive social identity by positively differentiating their in-group, which is the group they belong to, from the out-group, which are other groups they do not belong to. This process can lead to in-group favouritism and out-group discrimination. I will now provide a general overview of Tajfell's minimal group experiments. Firstly, there's group formation. Participants were randomly assigned to groups based on minimal and insignificant criteria, such as the flip of a coin or their preference for certain abstract paintings. These groups had no pre-existing social, cultural or historical meaning. Secondly, resource allocation. Participants were then asked to distribute resources, such as points or rewards, between themselves and other group members, such as the in-group, and members of the other group, such as the out-group. Thirdly, in-group favouritism. The results consistently showed that participants tended to allocate more resources to their in-group members compared to out-group members. This in-group favouritism occurred even when the groups were formed arbitrarily and had no real significance. Fourthly, minimal conditions. Tajfell's experiments demonstrated that even the most minimal and arbitrary group distinctions were enough to elicit intergroup discrimination. This finding challenged previous theories that emphasised the importance of significant differences between groups for intergroup bias to occur. And lastly, positive social identity. The findings supported social identity theory's central idea that individuals seek to enhance their self-esteem and social identity by positively differentiating their in-group from out-groups, even when there is no real basis for such differentiation. These experiments were groundbreaking in their implications for understanding group behaviour and the psychological underpinnings of intergroup bias. They demonstrated that social categorization and group identification can influence individuals' attitudes and behaviours even in the absence of meaningful group distinctions. Tajfell's minimal group experiments continue to be highly influential in the field of social psychology and have contributed to our understanding of group dynamics, intergroup relations and the formation of social identity. 
These studies have had a lasting impact on subsequent research exploring various aspects of group behaviour, prejudice and discrimination. Moving on to group polarisation. Group polarisation occurs when like-minded individuals discuss their attitudes, leading to more extreme positions. In the context of crowd behaviour, the elaborated social identity model suggests that the behaviour of outgroups within the same context can influence the social identity of the crowd and its behaviour. Interestingly, crowd behaviour can be influenced by police actions, and heavy police involvement may lead to increased cohesion and potential violence within the crowd. Deviance within groups, including criminal ones, can have both positive and negative implications. While anti-norm behaviour is typically met with punishment, pro-norm deviance can drive positive changes within the group. Understanding group dynamics and their influence on offender behaviour is crucial for forensic psychologists and anyone seeking to create effective correctional programmes. The social influence of groups is a powerful force that can shape individuals' attitudes and actions. Thank you very much for listening to this. If you enjoyed this content, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel for more psychology related topics. As always, we value your comments and suggestions, so feel free to share your thoughts below. Thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next video.